Welcome to this coaching and let's go with my biggest exploits. And it is a more, a bit more generic coaching because I thought that this deep dive or, or this spark of an idea is interesting to a lot of people who play poker and specifically tournaments. You see this table and I think this was 2017. You are on this table and you're thinking to yourself, okay, damn, like there are some really, really good players here. I mean, I think the only weaker opponent in this field is, is Didi. <laughs> Shout out to, to Didi Fuss. Uh, let, let's, see, let's see if he's there and if he will needle me when we see each other for, for uh, lunch the next time. But this is a, a pretty tough table and basically, I think a lot of people have asked me the question in the past, okay, like, what did you do that separated you from others? Like, how do you gain an edge on a table like this? And specifically also, how do you play a final table like this? Right? So you, you play, a, I think this was a 200k Hong Kong, so a, a 25k uh, or a 50k. And the question is, okay, how do you gain an edge on a table like this? Right? And the only way to gain an edge there is one thing to establish is, it's an basically infinitely complicated game with, with payouts. People absolutely underestimate the complexity of it. Yeah, so if you play a poker hand with you know, eight players and, and multiple actions on streets, it's already a really complicated thing. But if you play a final table with, you know, when you deep maybe 30, 40 big blinds on average, with on average 30, 40, 50, 60 hands in a row till you finish the placement, this is an incredible level of complexity. Yeah, so it's when you want to calculate the optimal strategy, you need to calculate all the possibilities of all outcomes that can come after one another. So that is incredibly mind blowing. And, and I think also one of the reasons why there's a bias towards underestimating that. But I always kind of think of the way it's not important that you have figured it out. It's just important that you have figured it out better than your opponents. And that's what we're going to dive in today is like, what is that? How do we gain an edge? And how do we win a tournament like this? Because that is in the end the question, right? Like, how do I gain an edge so that I can achieve this, so that I can, you know, outperform my, my competition? And how, how do I get better? How do I get to that point? And that's what we're going to dive into today. This was probably one of my favorite tournaments I've ever won because I feel, why did I choose this picture? Because I felt like, this was the pinnacle of my career. I really felt like I was on a level where I was ahead in thinking. And when you are ahead in thinking against the average, you know, like let's say the level of players, there's some weaker players, there's some stronger players, but if you're one step ahead, the edge you gain is absolutely incredible. So especially when it's with payouts because it's so extreme, right? So if you make a mistake, the mistake mostly costs you a lot or can cost you a lot. So um, that's what we're going to dive deeper into. Now. I think where ICM matters the most is in spots like this. Yeah, so you are on a huge final table with, I believe the blinds at this point were 100K, 200K. Like you, you basically play for life-changing money. You play for probably the biggest spot in your career. This was the 10K WSP main event online. And I don't remember how much first price was, but it was, it was massive. It was like two or 3 million or something. Uh, it was huge. So when we look at a spot like this, then it's really like it becomes even, even more important. And I think it shows like I always try to explain it in this way is try to learn the things and try to get better at the things that have the highest leverage on your success. And ICM or understanding payouts, how I like to rephrase it, has one of the biggest impacts on your success because it matters the most when you play for the most money. So when you play for hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars at some point, hopefully, then the better you understand it, the more you can leverage that into success. So how now the question is, okay, yes, but what can we do to get better at that? And I think showcasing also how I leveraged that in the past is one of the main reasons I have been so successful is because I think I spent a lot of time with that when people weren't really thinking about ICM at all. Like uh, back then when I started really diving deep into that in 2014 and 15, like a lot of people didn't really understand the concept. So how broad of a spectrum it opens from kind of, uh, you know, playing very tight, um, really understanding in satellites to playing super aggressive when you're maybe the chip leader, like the very broad spectrum of you have to switch gears, right? You have to shift your mind from, okay, when do I need to be, you know, 
play like really take payouts into consideration and, and be really careful and when do i just need to punish my opponents as much as i can so that's that's the spectrum of it and now my core statement is i think icm is being misunderstood and being misused as well so use it to your advantage now you ask yourself or ask me maybe but how, Fedor, how do I do that? Okay, like, yeah, maybe I understand it's misunderstood, but like, you, you're telling me, like, use it to your advantage, but like, what, you know, how, <laughs> how do I do that? And that's what I want to uh, dive a bit deeper into today is before I give you, you know, a concrete example is understand that, that ICM is, it's a, it's a mental model. So it's not like, I mean, it's a mathematical model, but, but it's being used in poker for me mostly as, as, a, as a mental model, as a simplification of something, like understanding how payouts change the underlying strategy. And so that is something that, that, that is the first thing you have to understand, right? Before you can dive deeper, before you can really get better at understanding, ah, this is how I use it, you know, this is where I want to use it, this is where... It's just helpful is knowing something. And, and actually one of the most valuable things for me understanding ICM and really studying ICM is because I understand how other people think about it. But then making that next step and seeing, okay, maybe there it's a bit flawed. Maybe there it's deviating a bit. And this is how I'm going to exploit it. And that's how I want to share my thought process of how I establish that. So let's get into the how. Now, let's do a recap. I have done a YouTube video. I think it's called What is ICM? If you haven't watched that, there, I think it's a nice cutoff of, I think, a 75 or 90 minute session I've done on ICM. And that video is on our Poker Code platform. It's, it's basically, it works like a mod lottery model. So I mentioned it before. People talk about ICM, people, ICM here, ICM there. I did this because of ICM. It, it's it's almost slightly tilting how it's being used in a in a way where if you actually ask a player okay explain it to me like how does it work like what does it mean right because in the way it's being used it's more an equivalent to okay there are payouts and that kind of means icm so yeah there was icm involved basically what they mean is like yeah, there's payouts involved, and so that's why I did something, but I don't really understand how the model works or how the math works, and so I'm just using this term to kind of justify things I'm doing because nobody can really attack it because there's no real better solution in it. So now if you go in a bit better circles of people who are you know, really studied and, and top pros, is they work with ICM in a way where they use mostly HRC or, or, or other tools to calculate uh, situations or, or basically, let's say it like this, they use tools that take ICM into consideration in the mathematical model, right? So think about it. It's not then chip EV as a calculation output of, okay, what leads to what chips, but it's more the same, the same mathematical equation, but with a layer of ICM, right? So the output is then not one chip is $1, but the output is one chip, including the payouts with the ICM model. And that is the important part. You need to understand the model so that you can understand the output so that you can make better decisions. Yeah. So ICM works like a lottery model. And that means that it's why I say always lottery is think about it like this. If there's a hundred chips in play and I have 30 and the other guy is 50 and the other guy is 20, then you draw for the first place. So 30 out of 100 times, so 30% of the time I get drawn and I get first place. 50% of the time, the, the guy with 50 chips and 20% of the time, the guy with 20 chips. So that's how it works. And then when one person is drawn, all his, all his chips basically come out of the pool. So then it's, let's say the 50% guy gets drawn for first place. Then it's my 30 tickets against the other guy's 20 tickets. So now, I get drawn 30 out of 50 times and the other guy gets drawn 20 out of 50 times. And then whoever gets drawn, is, and then you repeat that. And that gives you the probability of, or, or the dollar value of your chip stack. That is the only thing that ICM does, which is better than saying one chip is $1, but it's also not GGO. 
And now I'm using two abbreviations against each other, basically, which is, okay, ICM, there's this thing, that's this mathematical model. And then there's GTO, which is, if you think about GTO, it's basically the end game. Yeah, so no simplification, not taking anything out of it, no, no thinking needed. It's just a perfectly solved output that cannot be optimized. So if you think about GTO in this sense, then it would mean there is a perfect solution and it exists. We're just quite far away from it. And because payouts are being added to just, you know, hands like a hand of poker or a normal hand of poker, that solution is really, really hard to calculate for us with the existing setup, let's say it like this. And ICM breaks down a lot of the very complicated part. So it's nice to have it. It's better than just using chip EV, like just uh, looking at a normal hand, $1 is one chip. So it's better, but it's also flawed. And I think these two things existing at the same time is really important. It's a better mental model. It's not the perfect mental model. So it's somewhere in between. Now, I want to introduce this way of thinking where it's not really a binary line, but, but I, I simplify this way where think about, okay, chip EV gives you a certain upward, right? If you play a hand without payouts, basically, then it's this hand and that's it. The next hand is a new hand. So there's no real correlation between this hand and next hand. Yeah. So when we are in chip EV, then basically one chip is $1. Now ICM is one chip is X and the chip value depends on all the potential outcomes afterwards, right? So there is a value to it. We just don't know it. And now ICM makes a suggestion for that chip value. It says, Hey, I can solve it and gives a simplified, introduces a simplified model. It's being introduced as a layer into the calculation. It's like, this is a simplified calculation to give you the chip dollar when there's payouts introduced. Now, we have these two outputs and we can run the same hand with these two different outputs and we get two different outcomes. And now if we look at GTO, it's somewhere else, right? Let's say this is uh, an equilibrium where it's really an advantage for, you know, let's say it's really equal and then the other one is really an advantage for one person. So being very aggressive, the other one playing very tight. And that's mostly what you see in ICM, right? It's, it's more diverging. So it's more, it's bigger differences. It's most like kind of, let's say one, one player playing offense and the other one playing defense. Yeah. If you want to say so. So the guy who has the chip advantage is playing more aggressive. The guy who has the chip disadvantage plays more passive. And these are just two different strategies. And now GTO is somewhere different. And I think that again is really important to establish that it's different. There's no like, oh, it's there or it's there. It's like, we also don't know where it is. I just want you to use ICM as a pillar. Yeah. So I try to understand chip EV. I try to understand ICM and I try to come up with my own models to have as a third pillar maybe. And then the only thing I try to do is think in room. Yeah. So there is a certain direction I can take. And the way I described it to Curtis was, so if you think about zero being the optimal, now the question is how certain am I? And certainty plays a huge role in this. How certain am I that I have to deviate? The optimum is either on the more, let's say simplification now on the more passive or the more aggressive side. Yeah. And that is extremely helpful. Because if you understand that, okay, I'm really certain that I'm on the more aggressive side, like every step you make in that direction is specifically the first steps are just pure value. Yeah. So if you're very certain, okay, I should be more aggressive then you know, the first steps, the first steps you move into that direction are very, very helpful. If you move too far, then you're hurting yourself again. Yeah. So I, I think the beauty lies within seeing these different pillars, understanding and thinking directional. So that's what I'm trying to introduce in the session today, as well as that helping you understand the, the pillars better 
and then think more directional around, okay, how can I, so let's say I have this mental model and I have this mental model, like how can I optimize? And this is very spot dependent, right? It's different in every spot and that's the, that's the difficulty of it. It's not perfectly aligned, right? So not that ICM is always minus two, right? It's not like, oh, you just need to add plus two and then it's just GTO. No, sometimes it's minus two, sometimes minus one, sometimes it's plus five, sometimes it's, so it's, it's different in different situations. So kind of think about sometimes GTO has a distance to both. So it's okay, it's different than Chip EV, it's different than ICM. You know, I think it's a bit too simple to think like, oh, it's somewhere in the middle, but it's it's actually not a it's not a bad way to think about it, like, oh, it's somewhere in the middle, right? Like maybe Chip EV would be too aggressive and ICM would be too tight, it's like, okay, it's somewhere in the middle. And establishing that already based on a lot of information you can gain, the thing you do is is you use your brain to to become smarter and and add information on top. Yeah, and basically what you do is you you simulate future game and find approximations that ICM doesn't take into account to improve or, or filter for where it's not matching and improve that. And one anecdote, actually, one, one way of how I'm thinking about it, it's totally a different story, but I want to tell you this story. I was working in an options trading company in Chicago, and it was really, really, really exciting. Shout out to to Dan and Greg and all the people I work with there. It was a very, very valuable experience for me and I'm really grateful for it. And the way that they think about the value or the pricing, or let's say the underlying model that is being used, um, in a lot of ways, it's called the Black Skulls model. So again, very simplified, it's just a normal um, distribution curve or it's a distribution curve. Yeah, so I'm not sure if it's the same in English, but Gauss, uh, Gauss distribution, or at least that's that's uh, how it's called in German. So basically, that something extreme is unlikely to happen. Yeah, so something average is more likely to happen. So and then you basically set these things on a certain line. So let's say the average is a one percent move. Okay, and that then is the thing that happens the most often. And then other things, so 5% move is then much like, like less likely to happen and a 10% move is very unlikely to happen, let's say in a day or in a week. And so you have this, this distribution of events that can happen over a certain period of time. And the thing that I really liked about it is it's a model. It's just a way for us to say, okay, you know, unlikely things are less likely to happen and likely things or we believe likely things or what we think is likely is is more likely to happen. And when things are really close to each other, you can kind of form a line and that's not how things are, right? So the real distribution is different. You know, maybe 1% is like much likelier than 1.2% and maybe 2% is likelier than 1.2%. Who knows, right? Like there's some type of distribution. So in actuality, it's an amazing approximation for some things, but it's a flawed approximation for other things. And for example, when there are certain outcomes that are more binary or more extreme, when there's different events that overlap that are really extreme, right? Let's say there's two very extreme events that can happen in a very short time where the distribution looks extreme you know, it's, it's much more tail heavy. It's much more on the extreme. Like it's not gonna look like this of a curve, but it's gonna be like this of a curve, right? And then you can argue, okay, it's different standard deviations being, you know, lapped over each other and so on. But what I absolutely loved about the, the idea is the edge they gain is in the difference between the standard deviation that basically the model everyone works with and their own model or what they believe reality to be. So that's the bets they place. When they think, okay, it's, you know, it's priced at a 5% probability to move 3% and they think, no, you know, here it should be higher. It's like 7% bet. That's a very, again, a very simplified thing, but it kind of, it was a, a repeating pattern that they did over and over again. They, they priced volatility. They priced how likely an asset is to move. 
And their edge came from pricing better than others. And most others price based on the standard distribution. So what you do is you get smarter at understanding the titles, you see patterns and you, you gain extra information and you deploy strategies that find these differences over and over again. And I absolutely love this mental model because if I think about ICM and GTO, it is the same. There are certain spots where the difference will be negligible. You know, there are certain spots where ICM and GTO will be quite close. And there are certain spots where it will probably be quite far away. That's at least my hypothesis, you know. So I think keeping that in mind and kind of thinking, okay, where can I identify that difference? Where can I find this distance? That is your edge. And this edge is multiplied by the payouts you're playing for. So it's a huge edge, right? Because you play for huge stakes. You play for 100 buy-ins or 50 buy-ins. Like even if it's a $5 tournament, like when you improve at playing forehand or three-handed and, and understand payouts better than the others, that's going to be your edge. Now, it can be in the middle, but it can also be really close to ICM. And identifying that, requires to understand the model really, really well. Like what I've seen there, now it says GTOM, I didn't even see that before. So identifying the model you need to, or identifying differences, you need to understand both things well, right? You need to understand ICM well, so you need to be like, ah, okay, like I, I can visualize this, I can understand where, you know, what ICM does to this. So poker times ICM, like, ah, I kind of understand what that means, what they're doing, like I understand, you know, the lottery model, I understand what's happening here, kind of, yeah. So there, for this understanding, it's important to run these sims and like, you know, kind of look at, ah, okay, like how does ICM work? How, you know, how do people work with this? So this is important, right? And then there's this other thing where like, okay, but where is the most likely area for it to be flawed? And thinking about, okay, how can I build a model that thinks in certain ways and certain first principles and that's where brains are better than than just poor pure uh, calculation in these spots is we can approximate these 20 moves ahead situations 10 moves ahead but the calculation just runs four moves ahead that's it like a just dead stop you know no fifth unless you give it a fifth obviously over time calculation power will get stronger and it will go the fifth and the tenth and so on but for now it's like that's our edge right now is okay let's think 20 steps ahead or 10 steps ahead, slightly smart, you know, like, ah, oh, okay, I kind of understand this, rather than trying to run four steps, okay, regarding these mathematical rules, and that's where we can gain edge, yeah? So sometimes it's close, sometimes it's further away, and now as an exploit, and that is the crazy amount of value, right? And that's why I explained you all the things before, kind of this is the, the leading point for it is, when people, and let's say now this is passive and aggressive for you, so chip EV, more aggressive and ICM may be more passive, which isn't entirely correct, but let's just let's just say that, right? For maybe a, a shorter stack, then let's say, let's assume GTO is a bit wider than that, right? Let's just say everyone is playing according to ICM. Everyone's like, ah, ICM, you know, you're the solution. It's the best thing ever. And now let's assume the optimal solution is, okay, you should not play that tight. You know, you should be a bit wider, you should regem a bit more often. And, and the underlying hypothesis is simple is, I think, and that now that is where I'm, you know, leaning myself out of the window. Now, that's my thinking now might be flawed, you know, might be total bullshit. I'd love to hear your feedback. But my thinking is, I think that ICM undervalues or undercalculates future game. And I think that is mostly to the negative of the big stack. So I believe that it's doing slight mistakes as short stacks by being too tight because it doesn't see or calculate the entirety of the punishment that you gain by being too tight.